Hello, everybody. Welcome. Congratulations. You made it. Day five, graduation day of the course. Um, this is, uh, you know, taking everything we've learned and kind of, first off, it's going to be a stress-free lesson, all right, because we're really not dealing with guitar stuff so much. We're talking about, like, overarching knowledge, right? The stuff that's going to make you the band leader and not just the guitar player in the band. So we're talking about arrangement and, you know, uh, understanding band arrangement. You know, it's it's not enough just to be able to play the stuff on your instrument on the guitar. And that's why I'm not even holding the guitar right now. I've actually got a bass in my hands. So what we're going to take a look at today are the following things. We're going to take a look at the role of the bass guitar. What should a bass player be thinking about and doing? And, you know, this is very surface level information. We're not doing a whole bass course, just kind of the, the surface level information that every guitar player should be aware of this stuff. We're also going to take a look at, uh, you know, the difference between a walking line and a rhythmic line. I'm going to demonstrate to you what those things sound like. If I can find my pick, yep. Um, also, a little bit about drums and rhythm and, you know, the role of your drummer. How can you communicate some of these basic ideas with your drummer and what should you maybe th be thinking about? And same thing with keys, you know, keyboard player, organ, stuff like that. So very, very basic ideas when you start taking this outside of just, you know, your practice room and into the real world on stage. Uh, arranging rhythm guitar. A lot of times it's not just going to be you as a guitar player on stage. You're going to be sharing that stage with another rhythm guitar player a lot. And you want to be aware of how your rhythm parts can interact with another rhythm player. So you're not always fighting with each other. You know, and a lot of times you have to share space with each other. We've already talked about playing lead and playing rhythm, but what about when you're both playing rhythm? Then lastly, some advanced topics, you know, some things that go beyond the very basics here and, uh, you know, next steps for you, because this is a crash course. This is I don't want you to think that, you know, you're a blues master now, but I think that you should be if you've really practiced everything in this course, you are adept. You are you know capable of getting up on stage confidently. And as long as you have the stuff practiced and memorized, you should be able to do your job. But, you know, being an amazing blues player, you know, that's a that takes a lot of experience. And there's a few other theory topics that could help you get there. So that's what today is going to be all about. Starting off, what about this bass guitar thing? So um, keep in mind, I'm a guitar player. I am not a bass player. I know enough bass to, to record and to produce and to criticize others, you know, that kind of thing. So any real bass player is going to give you way better insight into this kind of thing than I am. And once again, this isn't a full course, just some surface level stuff. The bass is supporting the chord, okay? So like if my chord is playing an A, then my bass probably gonna play an A. And in a 12 bar blues, when it switches to D, my bass is probably gonna be playing a D. And when that 12 bar blues hits an E, I'm just gonna be hitting the note E. So that's like stupidly simple, right? All I'm doing is just playing the root notes. And I want you to hear what that stupidly simple thing sounds like. Here's a blues and A with no bass, all right? no bass and it sounds fine right but can't you hear that there's like a lack of floor isn't there something missing that's gonna change as soon as I put in the bass right and all I'm gonna do is just you know play the root note a I'll just do steady eighth notes E D A there's a turnaround E at the end notice I did a low E that time So basically, you can hear all I'm doing is just playing the root note, and it gives each one of those chords a lot of support. But we can kill the graduation day thing. We don't need that anymore. Um, but what we want to take a look at is, uh, you know, playing the thirds and the fifths. Or let's switch to this first. Let's take a look at rhythmic variation. We're going to stay just playing the roots. That's all I'm doing. Nothing fancy, all right? Just playing my root notes. But I'm going to give it some more rhythmic groove, okay? Like, instead of just playing straight eighth notes, listen. Three, two, three, four, A. bass it's really important when you stop the note when you rest the note right by resting the note it's almost like you get punched with those bass notes but by letting them ring out they really sustain it gives you like that floor but you can really just get so i mean think about that i'm playing one stinking note for each chord and it still sounds good because i'm thinking rhythmically i like to treat the bass as a rhythmic instrument i like to treat it as a drum and you don't have to know much theory to treat it like a drum it's all rhythm when am i playing that single note 
So that is pretty limiting, I admit it. And if you want to go past that, what I would think you would start adding in is a lot of fifths. The fifth is an extremely important note. And the seventh, uh, especially in blues, like the flat seven is going to be a note you're going to be always kind of relying on. So take a listen. For each one of these, I'll play A, and I'll play the flat seven, and then that would be like a G, and then back to A. And here I'll do the same thing. I'll just do D, C, D for when the D comes up. So once again, lots of rhythmic grooving, only focusing on my root and my flat seven for the bass guitar. And listen to how awesome this is going to sound. Here comes the chord change. Just the root and the flat seven of each chord, right? For E, D, Really, really simple idea, and it sounds fantastic. Let's throw in a little bit of fifths there, a little bit of thirds there. Think of the entire arpeggio, all right? The the A chord, the A7 chord is happening underneath, and the notes of an A7, we've got an A, a C sharp, an E, and a G, all right? A, C sharp, E, G, those are the notes of my A chord, or A7. So I could play all those notes, and they'll all sound good on the top of there, right? different kind of bass line, right? But these notes, I can still rhythm rhythmically plug away on. Here they are on D, the notes of a D7. But let's stop arpeggiating it. Let's just do like... of the arpeggio here. Right, so I don't really like to play bass lines like that. It's uncomfortable for me to just play only the arpeggio. Um, but it's just another option here. And really what I'd like to do is kind of mix them all together, throw in the roots, the fifths, the sevenths. And uh, more importantly, what I forgot to talk about is these passing tones, passing to, and I'm kind of skipping around here a little bit, but passing tones are, are notes that are outside of the scale, all right? They're not even in the key at all, but they chromatically like bridge the gap between two notes. So I was playing an A, I was playing a lot of this A note, right? And uh, I said, play the flat seven, which is G. Well, that's a whole step. And I can bridge that little gap, that little chromatic gap by doing that, that we call that a passing tone, right? And there's all sorts of times when and where you can throw those in, like between the four and the five. It's a great idea, the five and the four, to do that that passing tone kind of thing. So let's throw in a little bit of that chromatic and uh, that chromatic stuff, and you're going to hear how easy it comes down to. Rhythmic variations, lots of root, lots of flat seven, and a little bit of passing tone. You've got a nice, interesting sounding bass line. You hear that again? Here it is on D. There's the fifth, and now up to the five chord. Passing tone up, and now down to the five. Now what I'm doing, and I don't have this on the PDF, is just thinking pentatonic minor. So I know the pentatonic minor scale is mainly for guitar players playing lead, but I still like to think of it as a jamming device on the bass guitar. So I'm literally just playing the notes of pentatonic minor, and it still works as a bass line, right? I think that's pretty awesome. So that's the general stuff. Now, like I said, I'm not a bass player, so you know, don't take this stuff as gospel. Really consult with a real bass player. I'm trying to give you ideas to convey to your bass player um, when you are writing your own songs, you know, to completely give it up to the bass player. I feel like you can do that. You know, you should trust your bass player. But as a composer, you really want to be thinking about the bigger picture. You want to be thinking about, you know, not just what you're doing. You're thinking about the whole composition. And that means, you know, is my bass doing a thumping, driving beat? Or is it doing something more rambunctious? You know what I mean? There's all sorts of different options that you as a composer really should be thinking about, even if you're on the guitar. And, you know, if your bass player disregards that idea, you know, that's fine. But at least you kind of tried to get that idea out there, or at least gave him something to go off of. Because otherwise, he's going to have his own idea and his own, you know, um, vision in his head. So, you know, or her head and try to, you know, convey these ideas like that.
Um, the only thing I'm going to mention here is the idea of walking bass, and I'm not a master at that stuff. I've done walking bass in a few of my videos before for different things, like Seven Mode, Seven Musicians with Amy Nolte. I did a little easy walking line like that. And in those cases, you're going up and down a scale, not just these rhythmic variations, and uh, you're really going to be focusing on beats one and three. That's like where the chord tones are going to lock in. A lot of those passing tones will happen on the, you know, the other beats, the two and the four. And when you double this to eighth note speed, you're kind of thinking about the same thing. The really important notes on a bass line are the downbeats. The downbeats are like where the bass needs to live. If your bass is not really hammering in those downbeats, you're going to have some really crazy syncopation stuff. And especially with the blues, not focusing on the downbeats can create some issues, right? So that is the general idea of working with the bass. And uh, like I said, if there's any bass players like Okan, forgive me. Okan would, could give you a much better lesson on this kind of thing in general. But like I said, general stuff for the guitar player. We're guitar players. We don't need to think, you know, you don't need to be a master of bass unless you want to. But moving on... The role of the drums. And here's what I want to pull up for this. Um, really simple stuff. Okay, we're not going to go too deep in this. Once again, I'm only going to really talk about some really core basic topics here. And one of them is, let's see here. I want to talk about shuffle and swing and the way you want to be talking about the shuffle and swing. Because I wasn't quite honest with you last time when I mentioned uh, swing being based off of a triplet grid. The truth is, it's not always based off of a triplet grid. Sometimes it's based off of other things as well. And I'd like to show you what I mean by that. This is a steady 4-4 beat. Oops, hold on one second. Let's mute this. Turn this back on. Oops. And let's slow this way down. We've got some, like, hyper-mega-fast rock going. 45 beats a minute, and I know that seems really slow, but take a listen. Okay, do you see what's going on here? This is a basic rock beat. Every one of these is a quarter note. Quarter note, quarter note, quarter note, quarter note. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And if you notice, the snare drum is hitting on the two and the four. That's the backbeat. That's like, listen to you know any song right now. <laughs> I'm serious, nine out of uh, 10 songs you're gonna listen to right now. If you count along, you'll hear the snares hitting one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's the backbeat, right? And it's a pretty common thing to do. And notice that every one of these quarter notes has been split evenly into two even eighth notes. This is the straight eighth note we talked about in lesson one. One and two and three and four and steady notes and steady notes. So what happens to make the swing, here is the easy way to think of it. We instead of doing two notes per beat, we do three notes per beat. And that's what we are seeing here. Now stay with me here. I know this is review, but I want to talk about, you'll see where this changes. So every one of these is a quarter note. One, two three, four, and take a look. For every one of these, I've done three notes per beat. So I've got one, two, three, 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 right? Cool feel. It's got a triplet feel to it. Now, by deleting the middle note of every grouping of three, you see that? So one, two, three, one, two, three. I'm just kind of knocking out that middle tooth there, right? And what I'm left with is the classic swing or shuffle. A one, a two, a three, a four, right? So that's how I describe to you where the shuffle's coming about, and that's where you can see it. It is based on triplets. So when drummers are doing drum fills, a lot of times they will do um, triplets as their swing, as their as their drum fills. So they'll do one, a two, a three, a four, a one triplet, two triplet, three triplet, four triplet, one, a two, a three, because that swing fill is all based on triplets. And as a lead guitar player too, you want to be thinking about that. If you're going to be, you know, doing some cool fills in a swing groove, triplets are where you want to be thinking. But that is not the only kind of swing. This is a robot swing. This is literally a computerized AI swing. There's nothing uh, soulful about this swing, yet there are lots of soulful swings out there. And let me show you the variations of this, okay? This right here is actually a shuffle beat. You hear it? One, a two, a three, a four, a one. A two. It doesn't look like a shuffle beat, though. Do you see? It looks like straight eighth notes. And that's just because we've told the computer, hey, shuffle this. Just like real music. A lot of times, real music looks like it's written as eighth notes. But it says somewhere on that music, swing it or shuffle it, or it's got the little symbol, you know what I mean? And that means, hey, you are not going to play these as straight eighth notes, you're actually gonna play them as shuffled eighth notes. So we've told the computer here to swing these eighth notes, and this is what we get. One, a two, a three, a four. A one, a two, a three, a four. But we can adjust how much is it swinging. This is a pretty moderate swing. Let's crank it up here. And reason, I've got this groove function, and I can change this slide knob to increase the amount of swing. So let's listen to what it sounds like by cranking this knob up. 
Oh, now it's straight again. I accidentally reset it. So let's slowly crank it up. Here's a little bit of swing. You hear that? That's like a sickly swing. That's like a, like, there's something wrong with that shuffle. It's just awkward, right? Here, I feel like this is like a pretty middle of the road swing. Uh, two, uh, three. Imagine playing your guitar. Or a, you know, that's pretty standard right there. But we can go a little further and listen to like these more extreme swings. One, a two, a three, a four, a one, a two, a three, a four. So, you know, good drummers are not going to play you a strict triplet swing the entire time. There's these really strange feels that are, you know, not on that triplet grid. They're in between the triplet grid. They're kind of in this no man's land, like the microtones we talked about. So let's listen to that. You know, if I start playing to this, uh... Oh, sorry. I mean, that is a weird... That's a weird feel that you might not expect. And that's what we're trying to do is get something, you know, interesting, something different. That might be too weird, you know what I mean? But to put everything on the triplet grid is kind of, I don't know, it just feels a little robotic. And I, what I've experienced is that good drummers do this all the time. They really mess with this triplet. Um, Adam Neely's uh, done a, quite a few videos on, a, videos on a pentuplet shuffle. Instead of, you know, bridging everything off of three notes per beat, you're bridging every, basing everything off of five notes per beat, and you're kind of chunking out your pentuplet. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, da, 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 da. It's just this really awkward kind of shuffle feel. So that's the idea I want to get across to you is, you know, that there are different kinds of swing, and not all swing is created perfectly. And drummers will really kind of, you know, rush a swing or drag on a swing. And you want to be aware of that because that changes the feel. You know, this has nothing to do with the chords you play. Same chord, same structure. Your drummer's going to have an immense amount of control over that jam just by the way he plays that swing, if it's a swing. Or if it's not a swing, let's say it's a straight rhythm. Your drummer can play behind the beat a little bit or ahead of the beat. You're going to get a completely different transformative feel. It's very important with a style like blues. I'd also mention that a lot of the drum fills happen on the turnaround, you know, so on that five chord, that five chord is kind of a moment for tension. So the five chord at the end of your jam, everything gets kind of crazy. You dump back into that one chord, and that's a great opportunity to throw in a nice little drum fill and, you know, just classic stuff. You don't have to, but, you know, just general ideas. And dynamics. This is a problem that I have with actual drummers. All of you drummers out there listening, um, most of them have an issue with proper dynamics and keeping the quiet parts quiet and the loud parts loud. By keeping, you know, things lower in volume, oh, all this space gets created for really nice intimate vocals or a really smooth guitar solo. But when your drummer's always on 10, when his volume's always up, it doesn't allow for the ebbs and flows, the, the, you know, tension and release that is necessary for good live blues. Unless your good live blues is like punk blues and rock blues, where it's just da 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 then yeah, your drummer can just, you know, forget about volume altogether and you can all go deaf together. But, you know, in most songs, you want like emotion, you know, you want to feel something and that's where that push and pull comes. Dynamics are so stinking important. And real drummers, you know, real good drummers get this. Um, but us guitar players, we might not be thinking about it so much. And you want to be thinking about the dynamics of your drummers and when should things tone down so your guitar solo has more space? When should things ramp up so your guitar solo has more support? You know, the completely different variation right there. So that kind of thing. Um, next, the role of the keys. Now, I am a horrible keyboard player, but I could get away with playing in a very bad blues band uh, you know, just in, by spending like five minutes figuring out my chords ahead of time, like, oh, this is the one chord, here's the four chord, there's the five chord, you know, and just kind of plucking around on those notes. Um, the first thing I want to mention is the piano can completely support or carry a rhythm section. Get the guitar out of it totally, and you can just kill a 12-bar blues on the piano. There's so many more options that they can do. They can comp like we do. You know, we call it strumming on the guitar. The piano player might just call it comping. You know, their left hand's bouncing on the bass notes. The right hand's, you know, freaking out on the triads. They're even playing leads at the exact same time. Really hard thing for guitar players to do. So a piano is basically a one-man rhythmic section. Um, and they can also play these close voicings that guitar players just can't do. You know, if I try to play a 13th chord, uh, you know, it's going to be really hard to get every single one of those notes. Actually, it's impossible uh, to get every single note on a six string guitar ringing out. 
where a piano player can do it. They can also get these really close, chunky voices that are nice and dissonant for blues flavor that you just can't do on the guitar because of the tuning of the instrument. And that works really good on the piano, but it also works really good with an organ sound. Uh, anytime you're playing around with a piano, just try switching it to the organ patch instead and hear what that is going to do to complement your blues jam. It's going to work. I promise you, it will always work. Broken chords too, and you know, instead of playing the entire chord, the root, third, fifth, flat seven, root, you know, just play maybe just the third and the flat seven, bum, bum, those two notes together ringing out at the same time, give you these little chord stabs, right? Tiny little chords, baby little chords, little dyads. And those work really well on the piano. They work well on the organ as well. You know, you can do it rhythmically. Can't, uh, think of how many times you've heard the piano just do dun 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 hammering, away, hammering away at eighth notes. Or they can do more sustained things. You know, the organs really let those notes and chords ring out the whole distance. So plenty of options there. Now, I am not a keyboard player. However, I know an incredible, amazing keyboard player. And I'm going to ask you all to bother him for me. I am going to type into the chat right now. Um, his YouTube channel, and I want you to go to any one of his videos. How about the newest video he has? And I want you to go to his channel and say, hey, can you make a easy, quick, short video on how to do this on the piano? Like some, how do I do a 12-bar blues on the piano? And that's only if you're a piano. Don't bother him if you're not actually interested. But if you are a keyboard player, and if this is the kind of thing, like, you need good instruction on, talk to my friend Moog Lee. He is an excellent piano player, and I'm trying to convince him to make more YouTube stuff. So this would be a good opportunity uh, to check his things out. So um, that is the idea of the role of the keys. Hopefully Moog will help us out in the future. Maybe if you're out there watching Moog, you'll actually uh, fire up a live stream tonight and start teaching us a little bit about one, four, five chords on the piano. Now, next is going to be arranging rhythm guitar, okay? And I think I'm gonna switch over to my guitar here. That would probably be a wise idea, right? You know, like I said, you're often gonna be with another guitar player on stage. And, uh, you know, one of you needs to know what you're doing. <laughs> you know, one of you can get, you know, it's a lot of times some members of the band have no clue what's happening. That's fine, if somebody knows what's happening, they can kind of direct the whole thing, right? So the idea here is, you know, when you've got two rhythm guitar players on stage, how are you really supposed to balance things out? What's the deal with that? Well, here's my advice for it. And it sounds like I've got some guitar tone, good. Thinking about sonic space and arrangement, all right? This is the idea of arrangement in general. Everybody's gonna have their own little home in, an, in a mix. Low notes, middle notes, high notes. You know, what lives in the low register? Well, obviously the bass. The kick drum lives down in those low depths. The low notes of the piano live down there. So if your whole band is playing down there, let's say you've got low bass and kick drum and your piano's chunking away at the low stuff, like do you really wanna be playing more low guitar? You know, you could if you just wanna create this low trudgy sound, but like, the fact that it's all filled up in the low register means you get to fill in on the high register and kind of create some space between those things. This is the kind of thing of a producer or a mixer is always considering is like, where is my frequency space? What instruments are playing here and what, what sonic field do they live in? If we've got a ton of high pitched instruments, you know, banjos and tambourines and, and you know, kalimbas and really, really tinny pitches that are all pitched up really high and celeste, like, it's going to be, t there's not going to be any bottom end to it. So that creates space for low end instruments like the bass guitar. So think about stuff like that. You know, what is your other band doing? If they're all in the high registers, try to fill in, in the middle registers. If nobody's playing the low stuff, that's your opportunity as a guitar player to fill in on the low stuff. A lot of times, good bassists play in like the guitar range. And that's your opportunity to maybe go lower than your bassist and kind of fill in those things. So just be aware of arrangement and sonic space and not interfering, you know? If you're doing a solo and your rhythm guitar player is like rhythm strumming in the same range that you're at, you know, that might interfere with each other. So maybe you wanna do your rhythm stuff really low and your solo stuff really high, right? The guitar can play lower voicings and power chord style riffs while pianos play in higher registers. And I think this is, you know, as a guitar player, this is a great thing where we talked about this in, uh, I think it was the second lesson, but instead of doing chords, you know, just thinking of power chords, that creates all this room for all this extra stuff on there. And, you know, you're now taking care of the low end, the piano pl players can take care of the high end now. Now, as a guitar player, you really should be learning your chords in as many inversions as possible. I've only taught you a very, very small percentage of the inversions. I mean, like a, a fraction of a fraction of the inversions out there. But watch good blues players. It's a 12-bar blues. It's only three chords. 
Yeah, that guitar player, he's here, he's here, he's here, he's here. He's not even soloing. He's just playing rhythm, and he's all over his friggin' guitar. You know, uh, Bob Weir from uh, uh, Grateful Dead, same thing. You know, it's simple chord progressions, and he's everywhere because he is playing that A7 in any way you could think of and ways you cannot think of. So, you know, you find inversions that you like. I find the inversions, I'm a lazy guitar player, I'll admit it. I find the inversions that are easy to find, but, you know, people that are way into this realm, you know, there's just all sorts of different cool ways to play any individual chord. That would be really important if you want to kind of, you know, make your rhythm parts sound more interesting. When you have two guitar players on stage, try to think about contrasting and complementing parts, right? Uh, I've done this in every track that I've given for the resources here, right? I've given all these blues tracks as part of this. I tried to always include two rhythm guitars. Take a listen to the two rhythm guitars here in my no bass version of this A blues. Listen. We've got... If you listen on the left speaker and on the right speaker, they're doing slightly different things. Right? Slightly different things, but they're almost the same. One is palm muted, one's a little bit more sustainy. So, you know, they're in the same, but they're not doing the identical thing. I think it's kind of boring to just do the identical thing. Um, I think of strums versus arpeggios, right? One of your guitar players is doing something like that, and your other guitar player is just doing, right? Letting it ring out, and then again, a one and two, and very, very, very simple stuff like that. So, you know, complementing, they're contrasting. One is really active, one is not. Or how about power chords versus full chords? Guitar player A is doing... And guitar player B is doing... Right? Now you've got different things. They will complement each other. It's not... You know, they will contrast and complement. That's the idea. Is find things that are different but that still work together. Staccato versus legato. Um, I think uh, the one... What did I just do this in? Uh, oh, yeah. Here. My, my pomp and circumstance. My blues version of the graduation song. Um, the way I arrange that is... Let's take a listen. You'll see I've got two rhythm guitars. One of them does simple strums. And then the other one does this really consistent staccato popping kind of thing. And once again, I've panned them a little bit to the left speaker and the right speaker, so you can kind of hear the difference between them. Um, but it's just an example of how to get two rhythm guitars to sit with each other and, you know, not have it be that big of a, of a mess for your ears. So let me close down this file here. And let's see if this is going to work. Yeah. So, do you hear these two rhythm guitars? Let's mute the lead. And let's just listen to the rhythms here. I just realized you couldn't hear anything I said for that last moment. So let me try that again. Um, the idea here is that these uh, these chords are just doing the backbeat, the two beat and the four beat. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Right? That's one of the guitars. And the other one is just doing actual strums for each chord, like really heavy quarter note strums for every single chord. So two totally different patterns, right? Contrast, dynamics, complementation, or complementary behavior, whatever you want to call it. One is doing something really legato and ringing out. The other one's doing these short little choppy things, right? Completely different like that. So uh, during lead sections, I want you to keep in mind that, you know, let's say you're ripping out, you know, shredding on stage, the spotlight's on, everybody's freaking out. And uh, I want you to keep in mind that, like, you know, there's different ways the band can help you or sabotage you for that. First off, if your band is not doing their job, it doesn't matter how good your lead is, you know, good bands create good sounding leads. But I want you to keep in mind that, like, what does the backing track do to the space for your guitar solo? You know, I think that lower registered voices create more space because you're going to be soloing up in this higher territory. So you really don't want the whole band, you know, playing high inversions and high on the piano and high bass notes when you're trying to solo because it's kind of kind of get in the way of what you're trying to do. But if your whole band is, you know, in the lower area or the mid-range area, then it gives you this freedom in the, in the upper area to really kind of go crazy. Um, there are times where everybody should play in that high register just to give you the energy of something at the end. But it's just something I want you to be aware of it, be cognizant of. You know, for me, it took me a very long time to ever even start thinking about these concepts. So, you know, the idea here is even though you know blues guitar, you still need to be a blues musician. 
And all the knowledge in the world, I said in one of these earlier videos, yeah, knowledge is power. But, you know, the truth is, all the knowledge in the world isn't going to help you without experience. You need to know how to, you've, you have to have been there. You have to have felt it. You have to have screwed up live. You have to have, you know, seen it and smelt it and touched it with your own fingers. There's an, a concept of qualia that, you know, you can read about something, or you can learn about something. Um, but there's, it's not prep, you know, there's no preparation for actually experiencing it. That's the concept of qualia is like, you know, hopefully, yeah, you have all the knowledge to become a blues musician now. But that's not enough. That's just half the puzzle. The other half of the puzzle is actually doing the work, throwing yourself into that pool, feeling what it feels like and, and experiencing it firsthand. There is no substitution for that. And there are millions of incredible musicians that have done that. They've done the experience. They've gotten in there, gotten their hands dirty, and they don't know anything we just learned. They don't know what a 1-4-5 chord is. They don't know what a blues scale is. Yet they are incredible blues musicians. They're making blues. They're writing blues. And they know nothing about the theory. That's totally cool. They have the experience. That is priceless. To me, I am just not um, talented enough and I'm not determined enough to learn all this stuff on my own. Once I started learning theory, that's when I was like, oh, I can finally make music. Some people just do it naturally, and I certainly wasn't one of those people. So in my opinion, what you want to be doing here is you want to be marrying all of this knowledge and, oh, sevenths and thirteenths, mm, oh, we got the, you know, minor type two blues and stuff. So, yeah, that's all knowledge, and that's good. You need to know that, but really, you need to be marrying that with the doing. Get out there and actually play it. And, you know, keep in mind, being in a blues band means stuff like, oh, I got to figure out what my amplifier, you know, how to carry my amplifier. I got to figure out my live setup. Oh, I got to figure out how to book a show. So there's all these skills outside of that. But mostly what we're talking about is, you know, being the band leader and understanding the overarching, you know, uh, principles of what your band is supposed to do. And I do think if you understand all these concepts, you could start a blues band. I think you're ready to go. Honestly, start your own blues band and start having fun. Now, I would like to kind of wrap things up here with uh, a little bit of my opinion on this kind of stuff. I try to Trust me, I've got a lot of opinions. You're very all lucky that I don't express them all the time. But Al, I'm going to. The theory of blues, it does originate from black Southern America. And you can guess, that means that it did not evolve from the symphonic compositions that uh, are the core of music theory as we know it. When we use the word music theory, we're talking about stuff like Bach and, you know, like literally the, the foundations of, of, of Western music. Um, are you know, the diatonic scale, C major and, you know, secondary dominance and stuff like that. Blues doesn't care about that. Blues was never written like, hmm, what key signature should, will this be in the right, uh, you know, range for my cello? No, blues was written from the heart. It was written from the soul. It was an artistic expression. And it was an artistic expression so um, relatable across the world or across the planet that people started learning it and they started dissecting and they started thinking, well, what the hell is this? Well, it's clearly not Bach stuff. And I see no major scale in here. I see no. So it's a different kind of music. And what we decided to do is use music theory to describe it. We now can look at this creative thing, this thing that exists as an abstract piece of art, and we can try to analyze. We can say, oh, it actually consists of lots of dominant seventh chords and we notice that a lot of the melodies consist of the pentatonic minor scale and we also notice that uh, there's a relative it's related to major because the chords often use one four five changes which comes from the major scale so what i'm trying to say is that we are describing blues through western music theory but it took me a long time to realize like the blues is not music theory i remember thinking like wait major and minor you can't do that i don't understand how like it's it's blues we are just using music theory to describe it. Music theory does not tell you what to write. It's just a way to classify and, and you know, categorize and label. That's all. That's all theory is. And by doing that, it just makes me, helps me be more creative. And I know a lot of other musicians are in that same boat. So um, in my opinion, I've mentioned this in this course, the real heart of blues relies on dissonance, specifically the clashing of the thirds. I want to make an entire video just called The Clashing of the Thirds. It's that thing between the major third in the root and the minor third on top. I feel like that's the number one, um, uh, you know, person. To, that's, that's the suspect, the number one suspect for creating blues harmony. I would pin it on the minor third or the sharp nine and whatever you want to call it. The second suspect, I'd say, is that flat seven. I'd say that's a very important part of blues harmony. Um, and yeah, that's basically, I just kind of went ahead and said this, uh, you know, those other tones like the, the flat seven, the sharp nine, the tritone, um, those all can sit on top of my major tonic and the major tonic won't collapse. It just colors the major tonic. It's got a lot of 
support there. It's a good foundation, that major chord. And you can just blues it up by adding in all those other notes there. All right. So um, I believe, yeah, let's, here's some fun stuff. Okay. Let's say you've taken all this and okay, you get it. You want to go to the next step. Cause like I said, this is a crash course. Where should you be thinking about from here on out? What are the next paths that you should be um, you know, approaching and what door should you be opening? Well, extended chords. I only taught a few extended chords. The ninth and the 13th chords are only just a few examples of extended chords. So chord theory and the way you're going to get good at chord theory, jazz. Jazz is like the king of chords. No um, style of music is going to be more into weird chords and chord variations and substitutions than jazz. And I am not a jazz player. I don't hate it. I just, it's, I just never got addicted to it. So I never really dove into it. Um, I know enough to teach and I know enough to say like, the basics and I know enough to not embarrass myself most of the time. Um, but really, if you talk to a jazz teacher about this, they're going to go, oh, you think a 13th is a substitution? Let me show you a real substitution. They're going to give you all these crazy ideas. So the jazz and blues are very closely related, you know, very, very closely in a lot in historical ways and musical ways. So if you like the blues, then the jazz uh, will supplement your blues uh, knowledge. Learning more jazz will just enhance your ability to write better blues. You're also going to want to know arpeggios. You're going to need to know and memorize your arpeggios if you're going to be a better lead guitar player, because we don't want to just be noodling over every single uh chord we want to be playing with those changes so you know playing melodic leads means highlighting the notes of the chord when a d minor seven comes around can you play oh i guess i can't because my guitar was turned off can you play the notes of a d minor seven chord um when a d minor seven you should have at least one wait at least one way to do that and then, you know, obviously there's going to be millions of ways to do that of the guitar and good players have a billion ways to play a minor seventh, major seventh, dominant seventh, all that stuff. The modes of major. You should know your modes of major. I don't care what genre of music you're talking about. Modes are pretty stinking important and they give you a lot of different cool choices. So uh, understanding the modes is going to allow you to access different flavors, different kind of tastes, slightly different tastes. Dorian is great. It works really, really, really well in a minor blues, in my opinion. It also works great in a major blues. Um, and Mixolydian. Mixolydian is fantastic for major blues because Mixolydian has a root. It has, it has a, it's a major scale, all right, but it has a flatted seven. And we talked about, you know, how important that flatted seven is there. And we know that all those other notes seem to work over a major blues. So Mixolydian, Dorian, great options, but I wouldn't recommend learning them all on their own, unless you're understanding like the modal concept in general. So studying modes will enhance your blues leads. And bebop scales, by adding in an extra note to our modes, we get these bebop scales. For example, take our major scale. Our major scale has a, uh, a natural seven, right? But if we give it a flat seven and a natural seven, so we're adding in a flat seven, what we get is. And hopefully you hear that's got a nice little jazzy blue, you know, flavor to it, a little bluesy flavor to it. Since the jazz and blues are so closely related, these bebop scales are going to help you out. Um, I haven't studied them as much as I should. I will, you know, openly admit uh, I have a tendency to just kind of BS it and say like, hey, I found a place to throw in some chromatics. So let's throw in some chromatics. You know, that's a, a lot of the bebop scales you realize are just, you know, an extra chromatic gap. They're all octatonic. They all, you know, have eight notes and, um, you know, fun scales to play around with, though. So that's where I would think about going next if you would like to take this to the next level and then you could be teaching your own course on uh advanced or on uh playing blues guitar so congratulations now you can start a blues band legitimately i mean you need to practice this stuff first you can't just do this with knowledge alone but this is enough knowledge so once you've practiced this you could easily start a blues band you can play along with nearly any blues song after the first round of 12 bars you should be able to be like got it and then as long as you can see where the guitar player started oh he started on the second fret it's an f sharp or if you've got perfect pitch which i don't you know you have once you know where they start you should be able to figure out the rest of that jam deducing the chords of any 12 bar same thing you should be able to write them out on page because you should be able to hear oh they switched to the five. Oh, they switched to the four uh improvising rhythm and lead you know in two different flavors you should be able to do lead in major and minor this is all stuff that we've taught it should be an easy thing for you to confidently say yeah i'll play lead on that solo yeah i'll take the lead there to take an existing blues jam and modify it let's say you're doing an old classic right an old song that you like and you're doing it with your band and you think yeah that's kind of boring i sick of these seventh chords, you should be able to spice it up with your knowledge of substitutions and instantly identifying the one, four, five chords of any key. This is not just for blues. This is for like everything else. 
you're going to need to know how to do that. So I, you know, uh, that's a skill that you should be practicing um, outside of the blues. One, four, fives, you should just be able to name them off like your address. And um, writing, you know, writing the structure and chords for an entire blues song. This is something you can do. Instead of playing covers, you know, you can write your own actual blues composition that is unique, that is expressive to what you want to tell people because you're singing about the things you want to sing about. You're using the instruments you want to use, the arrangements you like, the rhythms you like. So even though, you know, this is all based on a very simple structure, you can still make it absolutely yours and unique. So... Congratulations. Thank you for watching this entire course. I sincerely hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed this course, you need to thank my awesome Patreon supporters for making it possible. This entire free five-day course is sponsored by my Patreon supporters. You got to know, I get business offers every single week, multiple ones every single week about putting an ad at the beginning of my video and taking lots of money that I could really, really use but it just ruins everything for me. Um, I've got these Patreon supporters that are willing to support this and they deserve, I mean, they're my sponsors, you know, so they deserve a, a huge, huge amount of thank you if you actually learn something from this course. So thanks for watching. And now, um, yeah, bye. But now today we will do uh, a little question and answer afterward because we're all wrapped up here. And as the delay is slowly winding on out, I'm just going to scroll up here a little bit and uh, say thank you to everybody for your joining. Um, but yeah, there's this long, long, long delay here. So I'm going to come back up here. If you did have questions from earlier, now would be a good time to ask them. I'll try to answer just a few of them here and I'll try to catch if there's any I missed from before. And uh, everybody, thanks to Aces Dawn for his uh, contributions in moderating the chat. Very, very, very nice of you, Aces. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, okay, so some of the more recent comments here. We are going to have a Q&A, and that's happening here right now. My first question is, is there a Q&A? And the answer is yes. So uh, <laughs> do I know of any scales with both major and minor thirds uh do i know of a scale with a major and a minor third off the top of my head i don't i can't actually think oh wait um no i can't um it's pretty rare to see that blend right there to see a minor third and a major third at the same time i'm sure as soon as you start approaching into the bebop scales you know you're going to see that kind of thing to me i think of like when I'm thinking blues, I'm thinking of the third as a movable third. I'm thinking the third it could be a minor third. It could be a major third. I'm not thinking of it as like a scale where you must hit the minor third and then the major third. I'm thinking of it as an option. Whenever that minor third comes, I have the option to whoop, flip it up into a major third, and I get that wonderful little honky-tonk. Right? I just love it. Or I could just skip it all together. Or, so I love that little choice right there. And um, yeah, so hope that answers your question. You like my hoodie? Thanks. Uh, I found it online. Uh, I don't know exactly where, but I was uh, looking for some like art and I found this on the side. I was like, ah, I'll buy that. What about Lydian? Uh, what about Lydian given the, oh, you know what? This chat is so silly. Every time I get to a, an answer, it like jumps me down to the bottom. So I keep losing my spot. I for, uh, Please forgive me here. Uh, let's see here. Can't thank you enough. Thank you. Really, I mean that. Uh, how do you make sure to vary the length of your lead phrases? This is a very good question, and it's a very hard answer. I would say the best thing you can do is be mindful. And this is like actually like life advice, not just guitar advice. But like uh, if you've ever practiced mindfulness or like uh, even just like just slowing down and thinking about what you're doing, it's a really hard thing to do. And guitar players are bad with this. But we have a tendency to just kind of let ourselves just go, right? It's just like you trance out and you're note, 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 note. And you're feeling it and you're in the zone. And that's good. That's a fun thing. That's I'm not saying don't do that. That's one of the most enjoyable parts about playing guitar. But... When you're trying to step back, try to have a third person perspective of what you're doing and try to listen while you are playing. And that's when you will start intentionally creating spaces and you'll start judging them. And you'll start thinking about them and you'll start thinking, oh, this space needs a little more time and this space doesn't need more time. But that means you're like your brain is in conscious, uh, uh, you know, observing mode while you're playing. And that takes so much practice. And it's not even that fun sometimes, I'll be honest with you. So it's a very good practice and I do enjoy doing it, but it's a whole different skill set and it's different for your brain. Um, if you've ever practiced any form of mi mindfulness, though, I do think you will see um, the same kind of thing going on there. They're being mindful while you're playing and trying to just like 
observe what you're doing, not do it, but just observe it. And that will create spaces naturally. And you will start seeing the kind of relationships between them just a little bit better. Um, I see that some people have donated here. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to see everybody and get their names correctly, but I do see Jared donated. Thank you, Jared. Much appreciated, man. Man, you're already on my Patreon. You're too kind. You're double donating here. Um, some more questions here. What about Lydian given the blue note is the tritone? <laughs> What about Lydian given the blue note? I don't know what the question means. Um, the blue note just usually refers to the word tritone, uh, but I, some people, that's like a thing that, depending on your music teacher, you might get a different answer. To me, the blue note has always been the tritone, and it refers to the tritone in the pentatonic minor scale or in the context of blues. But uh, the tritone, yes, does occur in Lydian. I've never thought of it as a blue note in the context of Lydian because I don't think of Lydian as that bluesy. What are your thoughts on the caged system? Because I hear some players love it while others find it limiting. I heard some players prefer to simply learn the triad shapes than learn the cage shapes. I love this question, Troy. You asked two really good questions for this stream. Thank you. Um, I think the caged system is pretty awesome, but I don't even know it that well, okay? My version of caged is like this bastardized version of it that really isn't the version. I just use it as a way to connect shapes, major shapes all the way up and down the neck and minor shapes, but I haven't learned all my caged shapes with scales. Um, to me, it's an important topic to look at, to kind of, I don't know, get the surface level of it and figure out, do you really want to go down this route? I don't think it's any better or worse than three notes per string. I don't think it's any better or worse than any other system. I feel it's very beneficial to have three notes per string shapes and some caged shapes and some arpeggio shapes. Like, it's all the same stuff. Um, but there's this whole system of caged teaching that I am not familiar with because I wasn't taught that way. And I never learned that on my own. I figured, okay, I could go down this deep, deep rabbit hole of uh, learning this specific, you know, way of doing this. Uh, but I just never did. I figured, like, if I need to, I will. I do know there's a great, I wish I could remember his name right now, I apologize, but there is an excellent lesson here on YouTube on the caged system, and I was going to make a video just like sending people to it, because it was such a well-done video, and I could never teach a video about the caged concept that well. So I say it's good stuff. I don't believe like so much in like, I think you should learn lots of things, and then throw away the stuff that works for you, because certain systems are just going to naturally work better with certain kinds of brains, right? And I've got to certain kind of brain and one system might work better for me than it does for you um i always hear learn your arpeggios uh are they not just picking single notes of a chord yes they are picking the single notes of a chord navi that's a good question but the thing is is that those notes are all over the guitar like here is an a major chord and yeah i could call this an arpeggio but that doesn't really sound like a guitar solo does it it sounds like a guitar solo if I like individualize each note, play it one note at a time. Now, now it's starting to sound, you know, it's starting to sound a little bit more like an actual, uh, you know, lead because I'm not just playing a chord. So the idea is that everything is a chord, right? If you can find where those notes are on your fretboard, then when you play them one at a time, they're going to work really good as a guitar solo. So my suggestion is practice your arpeggios over chord progressions, and you'll start hearing how they work so well as lead devices. Ziggy Protekos is saying, you mentioned different inversions and voicings. Will you make a video on triads, voices, uh, voicings, and inversions, how to create chords? Uh, Ziggy, I did do a video on inversions very, very recently. Um, and it does talk about voicings, but I'm probably not going to do anytime soon a guitar lesson on, hey, here's a bunch of different inversions. I don't feel like that's my strength. I think like a guy like Jens Larson, he's an excellent jazz player, uh, teacher here on YouTube. You know, this is really the domain of those kinds of people where they live in comping rhythm. And I kind of, you know, I've taught almost everything I can to you already in this course uh, when it comes to this style. I took my blues to a certain point and then I just kind of stopped because like I got as good as I wanted to get. I never wanted to be a blues. I mean, it would be great to be a blues master, but it wasn't my main drive. So I really never pursued it past this point. And if you wanted to, a guy like him would probably be the one to consult for that. So um, I don't know if I can really supplement too much for that. Core Tube loves the poster. Thank you, man. So do I. Seriously, the artist that I got involved in that makes me so happy. I think it's just, it looks so good. I'm looking at it right now, and I just love the Lydian mode and that alien dude staring at the sun. Will you ever do a full video about Locrian, similar to the one you did about Phrygian or Phrygian Dominant? Yes, Wind. Uh, Wind 2000 asked that. Eventually, I will make a Locrian video. It's gotten the short shaft. I haven't given it any. Well, I have to do a Locrian video. I'm doing the riffing with the modes uh, 
you know, series, which has been severely delayed, but it'll be worth it. I'm pretty sure you'll be uh, okay when you see what it all turns out to. So there will be a Locrian video, you know, this year, depending on how long my Riffing with the Mode series takes. Do blue songs have to be 12 bar? No, Chintan, CJ asked that. Uh, I don't have any specific examples for you now, but in the last lesson, we talked about the eight bar blues and there's plenty of versions of that. Um, you'll just have to look out for your own because I didn't prepare any examples uh, for you. But yes, um, many, many examples that aren't 12 bar and 16 bar. You can find 16 bar blues as well. Um, I'm pretty sure I am missing two of the people who have donated and I don't know actually how to find their names and that bums me out because I want to give them some oh wait I'll just scroll way up to the top and way down Andrea Surgon I saw you in the chat the other day thank you thank you so much Andrea and Jonathan Jonathan as well I do appreciate that um, it's not needed but uh, or it's not necessary for the course but it is certainly appreciated Okay, I'm scrolling up to the most recent questions now. I'm going to start kind of coming backwards here. Should you use the minor four or major four if you are planning to solo over eight bar blues in Dorian? Uh, Last Prism, that's totally excellent, excellent question. When I think blues, I think of the minor four chord because I'm thinking minor blues. I'm thinking BB King and stuff like that. When I think funk, I think major four chord, right? A minor. A minor to D7 would be an excellent Dorian jam. It's like my favorite two chord jam in the in the entire universe. It's one of them. It's just minor one to major four. I don't really think it was a blues jam in that context. You know, when we, the word minor blues kind of refers to the minor scale. It doesn't really refer to the Dorian scale. Um, and I'm being kind of, you know, ambiguous here. I'm being kind of cloudy here. These aren't, you know, distinct rules. So I think Dorian is kind of its own thing. I don't really think of it as a 12 bar blues, but you could make an eight bar blues in Dorian. You could make a 12 bar blues in Dorian. It's absolutely, totally, you know, totally cool. I would do it. I would encourage you to do it, but people might not call it blues. You know what I mean? They might just call it funk or jazz or something like that. So, uh, from Russia with love, Jake. Ah, uh, spasibo, spasibo. Zdrazdvoite, the eight zero fictional universe band. Kaktela. Um, okay. Uh, Wolverine is asking, how did you learn, Jake? Uh, GIT or Music Institute? Uh, I learned from the internet. <laughs> I took about two and a half years of private lessons. And, um, you know, I am a child of the internet. I, you know, the internet really came into, I was, you know, I had AOL back in the day and I was on bulletin board systems when I was in like first grade, like logging on with my 14 4K modem. Um, I've learned things from the internet a lot. I did take two and a half years of private lessons, but most of my knowledge comes from other musicians around me. Um, internet. You know, just studying things, videos, and experience, working, you know, doing the work, writing, playing, especially writing. You know, and when you write, you run into a problem. And I think, oh, I can't solve this problem. And now I have to learn something. And I get to choose what am I going to learn. Oh, now I need to learn about, um, you know, uh, harmony because I can't write my harmonies correctly. So now I learn about harmony. I come back to writing more and I run into a new problem. And now I need to learn more because I ran into a problem. That's the process. I only learn the theory that's practical because I only learn stuff when I run into problems, you know? So uh, that's my way of going about doing it. Lots of nice comments here. Very, very, I am like embarrassed at how nice the comments are here in every, uh, sometimes. It's very, very kind to see all these all. Do blue songs have to be 12 bar? Nope, I think I just answered that. Um, Scott Paul Johnson, yes, time travel. Thank you so much for mentioning that Scott Paul Johnson is the person with the incredible caged lesson. Um, it's really, really impressive. It's like, I think about how long I spend making my videos with all the animations and stuff like that. And I looked at his, I'm like, okay, yeah, like he may have spent more time doing that than I do on mine because I think mine take forever. But he did a really, really good job with that lesson. Um... What book would you begin rec rec what book would you recommend for theory? A beginner here. Mamoon, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. I don't actually have a good beginner's theory here for you. Uh, I would start with something just on chord theory. I think chord theory is a good place to start. You know, just learn your basic chords and how they're built and triads and stuff like that. A little book, not like a, you know, a giant encyclopedia of a picture of every chord, but just a little book that explains, you know, the theory of chords. I think that's a good place to start. For rhythm. Um, this is Ja Surgent is asking, uh, for rhythm, do I count time and how do I all on feeling? It depends, Ja. Sometimes I'm counting, sometimes I'm not. Being able to count is one of the most important and valuable skills I have as a musician. Counting is what saves my ass. Counting is what keeps me from falling on my face. It's what keeps me from like 
totally looking like a noob because counting is like a super like it's a superhero skill it really is a superpower so i advise you learn how to count if you don't know how to count take some drum lessons for a little while even if you don't have a drum set just learn like get a practice pad and two sticks but you need to find a way to get a grasp on rhythm and to me the way to do that is to verbalize it that's how they do it in india that's how we should do it here it's an incredibly powerful skill and i can tell you that it's uh it's irreplaceable so um you know a lot of counting also means that things become natural so you don't have to count as much so i really only find myself counting when things become really difficult or when i'm totally lost but it's a skill that i would not be able to live without what could an electric and an acoustic guitar do together in rhythm? Um, in that sense, David Andres, I would really think about, you know, kind of keeping the acoustic as the rhythm section and the, uh, the lead, the electric as the lead section. Uh, you know, the leads, electric guitars can play a lot of sustained stuff, um, you know, where like maybe the notes ring out. So just maybe just doing like for an electric guitar while the rhythms are strumming, you know, stuff like that works great on an electric guitar. Just simple arpeggios that sustain while your acoustic is... Right, so contrast, once again. To learn modes, you must begin with the root, right? Uh, that is the question from Will Shyetjens? Well, Will. Um, Will, to understand the modes, you really need to know major. Not only do you need to know the major scale, but you really need to know the chords of the major scale, and you should know at least what a major tonality is. You know, like, what does the major scale feel like? How does it sound? Writing chord progressions in major. If you know major, then you are prepared to tackle the modes. But I think it's a uh, mistake to tackle the modes unless you know major 100% backwards and forwards. Matthias Gonster is asking, where would you advise to start the road to shredding? Uh, good question. I think a great place to start with the road to shredding is three notes per string scales. Learn your major scale, three notes per string. And learn to economy pick your scale, three notes per string as well. Um, economy picking is one of the quickest ways to get speed right out of the box. And then those economy picking techniques work really well for little licks, you know, licks that are on two strings or sweeping licks. So uh, I did one of my very, very old videos is on economy picking. And I think it's a great place to start, Matheus. Um, uh, you can maybe check that one out. But keep in mind, it's an older video. Um, it's not nearly as uh, pretty as my newer videos, but I think the content is still, you know, uh, right where it needs to be. Am I strict about who I collaborate with on songs? That's uh, Hetriani is asking that. The answer is, hell no. I collaborate with everybody. I've collaborated with five-year-olds before. I have collaborated with strangers. Uh, I love making music. You, you, you know... I can make a billion songs in my lifetime and then I work with somebody who's not even good at music. They're not even, they're not, it's not even their thing. And they're making something that I can't make because they are unique. They have their own perspective. That's the whole idea with humans. We're all snowflakes. We all have our own perspective. And legitimately, I mean, you can't write a song that comes out of another person. So I find a lot of value in collaborating with people um, because it's just impossible for me to write um, you know, my friend Beardstank, you've seen him on my channel here before doing drums. When I write songs with him, like, I can't do, like, that's a Beardstank song. There's no way that would ever come out of me. You could give me a million years on this planet and that idea would never naturally be produced. It's not like it's like so advanced and so complicated. No, it's just like, it just wouldn't have happened. So that's the value of working with other people. And the more people you work with, you know, the more weirdness happens. So I like spreading it all around there. I think, uh, you know, expand the musical gene pool, free love. Uh, next week, what are we learning at 3 p.m.? I have not planned out um, lessons for next week. I wanted to get back to making my YouTube videos because I've been working on those in between these and I've got a lot of editing to do. I've got, and I've got a course I'm working on, like an actual course. So I've been keeping myself busy with that. I will probably do some live lessons from here on out while this quarantine thing is going on. I wanted this to be a one-week thing. I thought the global pandemic was going to be, you know, uh, well, I don't know what's going on, but this does not look like it's going away anytime soon. Uh, and I will try to make it a point to make some more of these public lessons here in the future, just to kind of give people something to do, um, you know, something to keep them busy, uh, as opposed to just my YouTube videos. Cause those take so long to make. Those are, you know, two, three weeks in between each video. Um, something like this, I can just live stream. And as long as I've got the stuff prepared, hopefully everybody can learn something and, you know, have fun. And, uh, it's not too time consuming, you know, so I'll figure it out. I'll figure out what we will do here in the future. How to practice moving chord shapes really fast up and down the neck while not breaking the shape. 
Uh, Grant Cleveland, I got to just tell you, it would just be practice, man. Uh, practicing with a band, uh, you know, I, something like that when it comes to just chord shapes. I just got to think, you know, start slow, build it up, and then start slow again and build it up fast again. Start slow and build it up again. Anytime the question is how to do something fast, my answer is always going to be the same. It's mostly just practice more and use a metronome. Uh, <clears throat> Bogdan Sebastian is asking, will I do many live courses like this? Like I said, I don't know. We'll figure it out. I got a lot to think about. I put a lot of time into creating this. And if I spend just as much time creating another one of these, it'll probably take me a few days out of my next um, YouTube video. So I want to get back to my YouTube videos. I've got some really fun stuff planned for you. Um, and I'd like to do that. So I'm going to start wrapping things up here pretty soon. It looks like I've gotten to some of those questions and some of the more recent ones. I'm just going to answer a few of these recent questions and then we're going to shut things down. Um, <clears throat> Will there be a video specifically on augmented chords? Shiver, yes, there will be a video specifically on augmented chords one day. When? I don't know. I am working. That's going to be one of those videos with an intro, and I still need to figure out what I want to put in it yet. Um, so sooner or later, you know, that'll show up in there. Uh, Pierre Lacombe asks, what is your favorite blues musician? Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to just go with B.B. King. I know that sounds pretty stereotypical, but come on, it was B.B. King. He, he, sounds, he sounds incredible. Uh, and like, I, I like the fact that his so, so songs are all playable, you know, like they're easy to learn the frets. It's hard to learn the feel that takes years and years and years. I love that stuff. And let's see here. Yeah, I see. Uh, I think that might be doing it. Are there Dorian and Mixolydian blues progressions? I wouldn't call them blues progressions, Renee. Uh, there are Dorian progressions and there are Mixolydian progressions that you could call them blues progressions if they are performed in a bluesy fashion. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess would be my answer there, maybe. Um, and uh, let's see here. AX is in India at 2 in the morning. Namaste, AX, and he is still watching this. Well, it's glad to see you. All right, everybody. Well, it looks like um, I'm going to be wrapping things up. Thank you so much for, uh, for sticking around for this uh, course. I hope you learned something. Once again, thank my Patreon supporters. If you see any of them in the comments, um, they really do deserve uh, my appreciation and yours. So uh, we'll do this again in the future. Stay posted. If you are on my Patreon, I will keep you all updated with what's going on there. Uh, if you're not on my Patreon, I think I'm finally going to finally get back on Twitter. I dropped Twitter because it's bad for my brain. I don't like it at all. I don't like posting. I don't like having to post. I don't like having to respond to all this stuff. But, uh, you know, global pandemic. Yeah, it seems like a really good opportunity to maybe get back on, on social media and figure out how to get it uh, uh you know, a habit with social media that isn't bad for my brain. Um, so I will keep you all posted with things uh, somewhere. We'll figure it out. But uh, until then, hopefully, you know, you might see me in the future with another live stream. If not, stay, t stay tuned for the next YouTube video, um, which will have a hilarious intro. I'm back to doing dumb intros again. So thank you all so much. Thank you, uh, Ace is Dawn, for moderating the chat. I see everybody giving me a nice goodbye there. Bill from the Hills, Jared Yelton, excellent. Eric Stark, once again, good to see you, Eric. I didn't catch you in there earlier. So, okay. Thanks so much, everybody. Adios, and have a good quarantine.